Welcome again. Open, if you will, to the book of Acts. We are continuing our drama, and it really is a drama. I'm enjoying teaching it to you. And uh, the book of Acts, chapter 15 in your Bibles, and we're going to continue on with the Jerusalem Council. Let me, let me do a couple things. I titled this tonight, Resolving Conflicts. Let me ask a question. How many of you, every now and then, get in a conflict, a difference of opinion with someone? And how many of you know that sometimes they just don't turn out right? How many want to be able to resolve the conflicts in your life? Well, we're going to talk about that tonight in a moment. Uh, let me quickly review the timeline of Acts tonight. We know, and we'll be giving you this as we go through the book of Acts, we know the year of AD 30, Jesus crucified, is actually probably 29. Saul's converted about three years later. AD 46, Barnabas and Saul go to Antioch. AD 47, Paul, Paul's first missionary journey, which we just, uh, we just studied. And AD 49 is the Jerusalem Council. So we know it's 49 AD. This is not something that happened right after Jesus was resurrected. This, is, this had time to brew. We know something's going on. And then we'll see Paul's second missionary journey, which in about two weeks, uh, I will be taking several people with me, a couple dozen people with me, to go literally in the footsteps of Paul on his second missionary journey. Then we'll talk about his third missionary journey, Paul's prison in Rome, in, uh, prison in Rome Paul released from prison, Paul arrested, imprisoned, and beheaded. So right now we are right at AD 49, just to give you a little bit of understanding. Again, the spread of the gospel universally is because of this statement that Jesus spoke. It is the hinge statement of, of the book of Acts. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And if you really want to see that, it boils down this way. We know that the geography was Jerusalem chapters 1 through 7. Uh, Judea is chapters 8 through 12. And now we are on to the ends of the earth, chapters 13 to 28. You are here tonight because of the efforts of the disciples. The central person in the first seven chapters is Peter. Then it switches in Judea and Samaria to Philip. Then it's now at Paul, and he will continue to be the one, the central person, through the rest of the, of the rest of Acts. The target audience for Jerusalem was the Jews. For Judea and Samaria was the Samaritans, and for the ends of the earth were the Gentiles. You're going to see a problem between the gospel given to the Jews and the gospel given to the Gentiles tonight. And then the presence of the church being is established in, Jer in Jerusalem, it is extended in Judea and Samaria, and it's expanded to the rest of the world. So you are in the expansion of the church. I told you last week, if the church were a balloon and it started in Jerusalem, it has been expanding and it's continued to expand. We now have 2.1 billion people who call themselves Christians on the planet. I'm not going to judge any of them. 2.1 billion people. This is from a small group that got the, Pente got the baptism of the Holy Spirit way back in Pentecost. So here is the uh, direction and the structure uh, of the statement lived out in Acts. Paul is now the chief character. We know a lot about Paul. Uh, let me give you just a little bit of his bio. Uh, we know this. St. Paul is undoubtedly one of the most important figures in the history of the Western world. I believe if Time Magazine wanted to have one person as the most important person other than Jesus in the entire world, it would be the Apostle Paul. This man single-handedly took down thousands of years of paganism, single-handedly. Now let me tell you what else it says. It says, uh, just a quick look at the headlines of his life are enough to understand his impact. His works are some of the earliest Christian documents that we have. 13 of the 27 books of the Bible are written by him. And he's the hero of another, the Acts of the Apostles. Famously converted on the road to Damascus, he traveled tens of thousands of miles around the Mediterranean, spreading the word of Jesus. And it was Paul who came up with the doctrine that would turn Christianity from a small sect in Jerusalem into a worldwide faith that was open to all. I want to meet a lot of people when I get to heaven, but one of the ones I really want to meet besides Jesus, I want to meet the Apostle Paul. This man was absolutely unbelievable. And the other one, believe it or not, that I want to meet, people ask me this all the time, is Uriah. How many of you know who Uriah was? Who was he? Somebody tell me. He was the wife of Bathsheba that David sent to the front lines to be murdered. And I want to find out about that guy because that guy had some, some amazing dedication to the people that were over him. So there's a lot of personages that I'd like to meet, but we're meeting Paul right now. Uh, so we see in Acts chapter, thir chapter 15, the theme is about the council at Jerusalem, the very first council of the church. The question is this, obedience or legalism? How do you follow God? Do you follow him because of obedience or do you follow him because of legalism? Is it what you do or is, there, or is, or is it just being obedient to receiving Christ into your heart. Uh, the argument is, is pretty interesting. We, we gave you these thir three, uh, well, it's three charts, but chapters uh, 51 to 8, this is where we went last week. And certain men which came down from Judea, I'm just going over it, taught the brethren and said, except you be circumcised, 
after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Now let me remind you, these men are not babies. They're not your eight days, eight days old like the, they normally circumcise. Somebody came to me last night in my, in my study, after study, and they asked me, they said, do Jews still circumcise their children? Of course they still circumcise their children. Uh, Jews, this is a covenant for them, especially Hasidic Jews. There's actually a man that does nothing more, nothing else, is, is there not? Nothing else... And, Aboel, nothing else than to circumcise. He has instruments to circumcise, and he's the one they call. So it's a covenant with God. Uh, wherefore, except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. So they're telling these Gentiles, fully grown men, that you've got to go back and do what Moses tells us to do, to have a covenant with God. Be circumcised. We know you're saved, but you've got to be circumcised. When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension, means they descended a lot, and disp disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles, and the elders about this question. I'm just reviewing last week. And being brought on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenix and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. They're still witnessing all the way down. And when they were come to Jerusalem, they received the church and the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. Then it goes on. But there arose up a certain of the sect of Pharisees. These are saved Pharisees, by the way. Not the same Pharisees that were going against Jesus. These believe in Jesus. These are religious leaders of, the, of, of Jewish leaders who actually became Christians which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them, the Gentiles, and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Now, the law of Moses, uh, by that time, had about 618 laws. So they're saying, in order to be saved, you've got to keep all these laws. It goes on, and the apostles and the elders came together to consider the matter. And then there had been much disputing. There was a fight. There was uh, arguing back and forth. Uh, P Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago it tells you how long, how much time had passed. God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, which knows the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did to us. He goes on to say this. He's sticking up for them. Put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Peter gets it. Now, therefore, why tempt you, God, to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? He says, why are you, why are you telling them they've got to do all these things? We couldn't even do all those things. And then he goes on and says this. But we believe that through the grace, notice that word grace, it's one of the first times you're going to hear it, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved. It's by grace that you are saved, uh, even as they. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them. That silence is not saying we agree. That silence is a brooding. It's a silence that's saying we're really not sure what's going on here, but uh, we're not happy about it. So the argument continues. Let's pick it up in Acts chapter 15, verse 13. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Men and brethren, listen to me. So you have some players that are going on here. The argument brought silence and a receptive hearing of Paul and Barnabas. Their input was obvious. It was not, it's not us and them. It's never us and them. It's not we have an extra something they don't have. And it's, it was not follow us because we're better Christians. I am totally incensed when someone talks to me that's a Christian and thinks they're super spiritual. Oh boy. There was not even a, there wasn't even a pin that dropped right there. How many of you ever had a Christian come up to you and they're super spiritual? They want you to know how much they know and they know more than you and make you feel inferior. No one should make you feel inferior in your Christianity. Someone may know something more than you, but they should never treat you or look down at you or condescend to you because you don't know what they know. That is not godly. It's not what Jesus taught us. So this input was, their, their, input, their input was obvious. It was not us and them. Because the truth is, uh, and we, it, you, they, they're saying, follow us. We're better Christians because we observe more laws. We follow Moses also. We don't just believe in Jesus. We follow Moses also. The truth is, we are not better because of what we do. How many are with me? So you give all your money to, to the church. So you're here every day of the week and you're, and you're working for the church. That does not make you a better Christian than somebody who's not. You cannot get to heaven by the works you do. We talked about that last week. It's impossible. You can't do anything plus salvation. Salvation plus zero equals heaven. Listen, the thief on the cross didn't do one single thing for anyone. At all. No, no work, never tithed, never went to synagogue, never did anything after he believed. All he did was he believed in Christ. Now, follow me. I'm not giving you an excuse not to do anything. I'm telling you that if you're using those things to say you're better than someone else, or you do more, you are drastically wrong. Okay, so let me give you some statements that would be great for us to remember because there's an argument going on here. There's a conflict going on here. And you just admitted, many of you, that sometimes you're in conflict. So am I sometimes. So let me just give you some, some basic conflict resolution ideas. Here's this. Conflict happens all the time. It's part of everyday life. 
It occurs across all age groups. It can happen to anyone. It can be personal. It can be global. It has many different causes. It can escalate if it's not resolved. You're looking at the Middle East conflict. It's called the Middle East conflict. It's not resolving. I'll show you the ways to resolve a conflict. They're not doing any of it. And also is this. It's not always negative. Sometimes when you have a disagreement with someone in a conflict, it's good because both of you have to sit down and talk so you understand what's going on. And it can be solved in different ways. So what does conflict mean to you? Well, let me give you a little bit more about how to get out of conflict or how to resolve it. Communication is always important. Let me tell you something. If you're, if you're fighting with somebody or if you're in conflict with someone, I don't want to use the word fighting, you're in conflict when you don't talk. And there may, may be a time when you have to pull apart and not talk because your talk means nothing. But if you don't talk initially, the other person is going to fill in the blanks. You don't say anything. They're going to fill in what you think, what they think you think. And then this, show understanding of the problem. Present your point of view. Explain how you feel. Negotiation. Brainstorm possible solutions. Accept the need for compromise. Choose the fairest solution. Implement your plan. And consolidation. Evaluate your plan. Communicate your feelings. How do you resolve a conflict? Let me give you a couple pointers to it. It's this. Be a model of calm and control. If you're in a conflict, whether it's a husband or a wife, or whether it's a child and a father, a child and a mother, and you're screaming and yelling at them, you're not going to resolve anything. My mother was a screamer. When my mother, my mother fought with my father, and she was a screamer, she was a screamer at us. As soon as my mom got into her screaming mode, the cats in the neighborhood would tiptoe away from the house. I could still hear her shrill voice when she would scream. That never resolves a thing. Don't give in to emotional outbursts. If you can possibly help it, I'm very passionate when I talk. So if somebody's going to ask me something, I get very passionate. They think I'm angry when I get passionate. I'm not angry. I'm just passionate. But I've got to be careful with my passion, because not everybody's as passionate as I am. How many are with me? Cheryl, stop shaking your head. <laughs> All right. Don't assume people, don't assume people are, are being difficult intentionally. Sure, some people are, but not always. Sometimes somebody just has a difference of opinion than you. This is the church. They're in a conflict. There's a real difference of opinion. These are not bad guys and good guys. They're all good guys. One, saying we gotta, one side saying we have to do, make them do this. The other side no, saying no, we can't. They have to resolve this thing. Find a quiet place to, in it to resolve conflicts privately. You know what I tell couples when I, get, when I counsel them, which I do quite a bit, and they're fighting all the time? I tell them to talk about certain issues that, will, that are, that are push-button issues that will get them, get them fighting. And I say, but I don't want you talking about them at home. I want you to go in a very busy restaurant. Sit with people that are next to you so you have nothing to do but to whisper to each other. And it's really hard to raise your voice when people are next to you and you're whispering. So it works. Set some ground rules for discussion. No raising voices. You want to talk to me about something and it's negative? The rule is none of us raise our voices. Secondly, it's not a debate. Speak only for yourself. I phrases, not we or we heard or we think. It's got to be I because the we are not there when you're one-on-one -on -one with someone. How many are with me tonight? Yeah. This is pretty good stuff. Um, confront the issues, not the people. Don't start making a personal attacks about a person. Just confront the issue and maintain or enhance self-esteem. Now, that's just a side point for you. I'm throwing that in without even taking an extra offering. I'm just giving it to you. All right, so you do with that what you want to. This is what's going to have to happen at this Jerusalem Council. Nothing gets solved when you go against any of these principles, ever. So we see something happening. We see that, that uh, Peter stands up and says something. He defends the Gentiles, says the Holy Spirit was given to them. It was, it was the same to them as it was to us. Then we see that Paul and Barnabas get up and talk about the miracles and the salvations that happened. They're witnessing. And then this man steps up. James, the brother of Jesus. Uh, by the way, we have evidence that he was his brother. This is the James Ossuary that was found in 2000. J James, it says in Hebrew, James, the brother of Jesus. And so that was found in your lifetime. So the brother of Jesus, who had risen to power in the Jerusalem church, was obviously the person in charge of the meeting. It's interesting to me because Peter, many times, Catholic Church will say he's the, he's the first pope. He is the, he's the one that's the founder of the church. Yet James is the leader of the Jerusalem church, the epicenter of Christianity. Kind of interesting. For he spoke last and he summarized and crystallized what he had heard the Holy Spirit saying to the group. And he followed the pattern of his brother Jesus in anchoring his words to Scripture. Watch what he says. He says this. He says, Simeon, he calls Peter Simeon. That's another word for Simon. Simon has declared how God at the first did visit Gentiles. Now, why would he call him Simeon? Why would he not call him Peter? 
We'll tell you that in a moment. Uh, he's very smart, by the way. James, I have a great appreciation for. He, I understand why he's the leader of the Jerusalem church. He has an amazing mind. Uh, Simeon has declared how God at the first to visit the Gentiles to take them out of the people for his name. So he's saying, Simon, Peter told you this. And to this, agree, to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. Now he's using what Jesus would use. He's going back into scripture to defend what he's going to say. He says, after this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David which has fallen down. I will build again the ruins thereof and I will set it up. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles. He's quoting something. Upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. So he's quoting an Old Testament prophet. I won't ask you who it was. I'll tell you. It's Amos. Amos 9.11. On that day I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and repair its damages. Talking spiritually, I will raise up its ruins and rebuild it as the days of old, that they may possess the remnants of Edom and all the Gentiles who called by my name, says the Lord who does this thing. So, so James says, guys, did you not read Amos? You want to be perfect Jews. Did you not read Amos? He said this day was coming that the Gentiles would call upon his name. He's building up his kingdom. And in fact, the church is the building of the kingdom of God. It is the kingdom of God. The church is being built. And so James recognizes it. I have to believe that Peter and James are right down the line with the Holy Spirit. Somebody say amen. His authority is based on Amos chapter 9, verse 11 to 12. The clear prophecy of God's plan to call all of mankind unto himself. I told you this before and I need to tell it to you again. Why are the Jews called God's chosen people? Are they better than someone else? No. The reason they're called chosen people is they were chosen to birth the Messiah that all men might come to him. And so that's what they were chosen for. It's why he protected them. Why he gave them Levitical laws of diet so they could preserve them as a nation. Why he took them out of a famine-stricken Canaan and brought them to, to Egypt even though they were slaves so he could preserve them. Why he took them out of there. They were down to 70 souls by the way. You lose those males and that's 70 souls. That's all the Jews were down to at one time. You lose those 70 souls and you don't have a Messiah. So he preserves them, brings them back into their land. That's why they're chosen. And so they're chosen, as Amos says, so the Gentiles, so he can build up his kingdom and the Gentiles can come in. The church is God's plan. It's God's plan. It's the next step after, after Judaism. It's God's plan to bring the Gentiles in so that all of us would be one in God. Come on, somebody say amen. So the clear prophecy of God's plan to call all mankind to himself. It's what the group needed to hear. It's what their world needed to hear. It's what we need to hear. It's Listen, and man, it's what America and the messed up world of today needs to hear. And I hear people, critics all the time. It's going out on YouTube. I'll get these, I'll get these questions all the time. Religion is, is the problem with all the world. There's so many killed. You know why? Because religion isn't God's way. Relationship is God's way. God didn't say go and start a religion. He said have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus is the answer. Watch this. To everything, every single thing, Jesus is the answer to. Unless we come to that knowledge, we're going to be fighting with each other about hair color. We're going to be fighting with each other because if we have hair or we don't have hair. Hello. We're going to be fighting with each other because we're black or we're white. We're going to be fighting with each other because we're Israeli or we're Arab. All of those things are things of, of our own pride. Jesus is the answer. Answer. It's the answer. He's the answer in your family. You know why some of your family members shun you and don't like you? Because you have Jesus and they're convicted. Whoa. Jesus is the answer. Let me tell you, they'd be your best friends if they get saved. <laughs> Amen, Pastor Mark. You're absolutely right. I was just telling some. Okay. All right. I was away, but I'm back now. There is no, there is, listen, there is no healing of differences without Jesus and the Holy Spirit. There's no peace. There's no calm. There's no order. There's no sense to life and living without Him. Jesus is all we need. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. And if I could show this to you, it would be this. Only Jesus can turn a mess into a message. You heard me say this many times. A test into a testament. Can't even spell them without it. A trial into a triumph. A victim into victory. He is worthy to be praised because only He can do it. Only He can heal. Only He can heal families, heal bodies, heal hurts. Only Jesus can do it. I am a Jesus freak. I think that the answer to everything is Jesus. I think if you see, sit somebody down and talk about Jesus, you can usually get to the bottom of something. Now notice what happens. We see that James calls him, oh, no, let me give you this before we get there. I am not ashamed to say how desperately I need Jesus in my life. I'm not ashamed to say that. I'm not ashamed to say when somebody talks to me that, listen, I don't know, I don't have all the answers. All I know is that I need Jesus. Uh, if you want to see it in a better way, it's true discipleship involves deep relationships. Jesus didn't simply lead a weekly Bible study. 
That's not what he did. Uh, he lived life with his disciples, and he taught through actions as well as his words. I love what John the, John the Baptist's disciple said to Jesus when John said, Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. He points Jesus out at his baptism. His disciples, who by the way were probably James and John, said to Jesus, they go up to him because John points them out. They go up to him and they said, Where do you live? First thing they said to Jesus, Where do you live? Why were they saying that? We want to go home and observe you. If we're going to follow you, we want to observe you. Who are you? What do you do? I think, I think Christianity sometimes has been given a, a bad taste in America because of televangelists. I think we hear things that are godly from TV, but you don't know who those people are. Follow somebody for a little while. If you're in a church, this is going to get me in trouble, but if you're in a church, find the pastor when he's preaching. You're going to listen to him. And as soon as you see the pastor preach, find his wife and look at her. If she's lost and she's fumbling someplace and she's not paying attention and she's just... And do it not just once, but do it all the time. Every time you go to the church, you say, Pastor, why would I do that? Because if he hasn't reached his wife, what makes you think he's going to reach you? Amen. Something's not being lived. And so it's very important for us to observe. Jesus was a, was a, was a, was a gospel teacher. He taught, his, he taught truths and he was observed doing those truths. So watch what's going on here. So he says, Peter, Simeon... Uh, he tells about Simeon being the one that, uh, that needs to be looked to. He says this. He says, Simeon has declared how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. You know what? I'm starting to get excited talking about Jesus. I don't know why, but I'm starting to really kind of feel some stuff here. I'm kind of feeling like, you know what? I have the answer for the world. Why doesn't somebody call me up? Why, why do we not have the Congress knocking at my door saying, what's the answer? Why isn't the president tweeting to me? Why isn't he calling me? I could tell you the answer to the world. Come on, somebody say amen. So could you. You know more than most leaders in the world. Because Jesus is the answer. Now watch. So he says, Simeon. It's Peter's pure Hebrew name, his Hebraic name. James uses it because he's speaking to pure Hebrews. He's going down a slippery slope. These people are opposed to him. So he pulls Peter's testimony in and uses his pure Hebrew name. So they realize that Peter's not some convert to some other religion. That he's a pure Jew that has found Christ. James continues, and he says something pretty amazing. Before he does that, let me give it to you this way. James shows his wisdom by starting off, not by referring to Paul's speech, but to Peter's. Paul was the last one that spoke. And he calls him by his very Jewish name, Simeon. The Gentiles present are already convinced. He needs to convince the Jews. God is taking out a people for his name from the Gentiles. So he's very smart. That's why I tell you about James. So he goes on, and he says this. Acts 9, 15, 19 to 20. It is my judgment, therefore. By the way, the word there in the Hebrew is chrysos. It means, it's my opinion. He's not trying to force anything on anyone. This is not an argument. This is, a, this is something that's a conflict. So he said, this is my opinion. Now, he holds a lot of weight in his opinion because he's the leader of the Jerusalem church. If you have people setting authority over you, you better listen to their words. Amen. Come on, somebody say amen. Because they have an authority. So he says, this is my opinion. Uh, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For Moses had been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogue on every Sabbath. So he gave them four requirements. He says that they want to be part of us. We should tell them that they just should live right. They should, they should abstain from food polluted by idols. They should stay away from that. It's going to give a wrong message to people if they eat food that was once offered to idols and now they eat it. They'll look like they're participating in it. They should stay away from sexual immorality. Man, should we, uh, if we just had these four laws in America today, I think we'd do really well. Somebody say amen. Uh, that sexual immorality brings a whole host of problems. Uh, they should stay away from meat, uh, meat of strangled animals. Now, why is that? Because when animals are strangled, there's things that go off in their body. There's endorphins and things that go off in their body. There was no FDA, not that they help us a whole lot today. But there was no way to, so it would actually kill them. It would, it would kill out their, kill them, and, then, and uh, they wouldn't be able to populate, actually, as Christians. And from blood. So the, the reason why from blood is because Satanists and the pagans ate blood. They drank blood. It was a ritual. So he's keeping them away from things that are going to be associated with devil. He's keeping away from things that are going to be associated with barbarians. He's trying to let them know about these laws. So watch. So listen to this. Let's follow the whole thing. Let's read what's not there. Let's read something that's in this thing. Before I do, here's what he says. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Stop thinking that you should be giving them laws and make them jump through hoops in order to get to God. James was the, again, used the Greek verb krenio for judge, and it means to, it, to it's my opinion. So uh, here we have 
no Hebrew customs. They don't have to do all the laws. I'll continue on that in a moment. He's telling them, you don't have to do this, you don't have to do that, you don't have to do this. Listen, here's what he's saying. Acts 15. Gentiles should abstain from food polluted by idols, sexual immorality, meat of strangled animals, and blood. He goes on to say this. Then pleased that the apostles and elders with the whole church to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. So he is saying something, and it's kind of pleasing everyone in the church. At, at, at verse 22. Uh, and it goes right here, if you want to see verse 23, it says this. And they wrote letters to them by them. After this manner, the apostles and the elders and brethren send greetings unto the brethren, which are of Gentiles and Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. So this is where the church is spread. And so he sends them there. I'm going to use my new pointer. So they're here. He sends them back to Antioch, Syria, Antioch, and sends a letter to the Cilicia. This is how far the church has spread. It's going to the known world. And he sends these letters to them, and he's going to write something. Now, uh, and here we have the content. I'm going to read it to you. Of the first official letter that is sent from the Jerusalem Council to the Gentile believers. I am so glad that Dr. Luke recorded it. This is a letter that was sent by Paul and Barnabas back to Antioch first. It was copied and sent to all the churches everywhere around the known world where Christianity has been spread. And here's what it says. It says this. Since we have heard that some of our number whom, to whom we gave no instruction have disturbed you with their words. Some of Christians have come to you and they've disturbed you with their words. Man, can you imagine Christians disturbing you with their words? That ever happened to you? Okay, watch. Um, unsettling your souls, it seemed good to us, having become of one mind to select men to send to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, we have sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will also report the same things by word of mouth, for it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. Judas and Silas, by the way, are probably Hebrew Jews from the other side who are convinced now. And so they're going also. Uh, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit to, to, lay, to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials, that you abstain from things sacrificed to idols, from blood and from things strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves free from such things, you will do well. Farewell. A very short letter, but it tells them what they can do. So watch. So we see the apostles to the Gentiles, the decision for the Gentiles in the letter of Acts 15, 23 and 29. Note, no circumcision and no Sabbath. They didn't tell them go to church on Saturday. They didn't tell them you got to get circumcised. They, they didn't say anything like that. So when somebody tells you that you're a Christian and you want to go listen to the Hebrew, Hebrew teachings and you got you to worship on the Sabbath, they are Judaizers. They're trying to get you. I understand people getting excited with Jewish culture. I am. I want to know everything I can about it so, because I see Christ in it. But I am not conformed, nor do I have to conform to the laws of Judaism. Somebody say amen. Yet there's churches that will tell you that you, you're worshiping wrong because you're worshiping on Sunday. Well, they're going against the disciples because the disciples said, never set a restriction on when you should worship. We're used to Sunday. Did you know you could worship on Mondays if you wanted to? I mean, you can have church services now. For the, did you know that? We do a lot by tradition. Food sacrifice styles, blood, meat is strangled down, sexual morality. Let me go a little bit further with this. New Christians need not become Jews first. No mosaic burdens. Circumcision wouldn't have to be required converts to the faith. The mission of the Gentiles was approved as authentic. The council opened the church to all believers. This is what made the church spread. Thus the church became Catholic. The word Catholic does not mean Roman Catholic. Catholic means universal. Whether you know it or not, you're Catholic. You're part of the universal church. Roman Catholic is something different. Uh, Catholic, the root sense of the word universal or all-inclusive. From then on, belief in Jesus Christ and participation in his church became the defining characteristic of a Christian. Before that, they were not even sure who were Christians. They didn't know if you had to do the laws. Let me, let me just tell you a little bit as we go a little bit further because I'm going to get, get, uh, say some controversial things. The end result, circumcision, ritual, circumcision, ritual bathing, observing Sabbath, Saturday as the Sabbath, even tithes, watch this, should not be placed on Gentile Christians. Now, you may get really messed up with that. Pastors may get really messed up with that. But they didn't say, tithing is Mosaic law. We don't tithe, now listen to me, I'm not giving you an excuse not to tithe. We don't tithe because it makes us acceptable and, it's, and we're following the Mosaic law. We tithe because the principle of giving to God is that he will press it down, shake it together, and give it back to you. We tithe because of obedience. We don't tithe to be a member of the church. 
There are churches that say you've got to be a tithing member. Well, I've never said that to anybody. Let me tell you why. I think you should. I think if you go someplace and you get fed from it and it comes from the storehouse, you should tithe. I think you're pretty stingy if you don't tithe, and I think you're not real smart either. 23% of the church in America do not tithe. 23%. And we wonder why people in America are leaving from paycheck to paycheck. Because if you don't put God first, you are killing yourself right off the bat financially. We've tithed ever since I got... When I first got saved and Cheryl told me I had a tithe, I knew nothing about tithing. Let me tell you about money in the church with me. When I was a, when I was a kid, I was an altar boy. As an altar boy, we had a shrine out back behind the church and they, put, they had candles in the shrine in a little box. There were 50 cent candles and there were dollar candles. It was a grotto. And so people would come, penitent people would come, they'd kneel down, they'd light their candle and they'd put their dollar in the box. Uh, I would wait till that box got filled up and I would go and jimmy that box and take all that money and blow out all the candles. Ah! Just listen. So I was an altar boy. So we had a... <laughs> Shad, I'm sorry. So we had this altar, we had a, a, a basement where they actually served mass also. And instead of the boxes that they had up in church, which were foolproof, you couldn't get in those, uh, they had these little bags like we pass around here. So what they would do, the altar boys would take the bags after the offering, and we would put them in the back of the, back of the altar so the priest could come up. Uh, can I tell you that I, I was probably one of the richest altar boys there was? <laughs> I'd take dollars out of that regularly. Oh, didn't you have a problem with that? Of course not. I wasn't saved. I was doing a religious thing. I didn't have any problem with it at all. As a matter of fact, it was pretty cool. Ladies, listen, ladies in our, in our, in our neighborhood... On one Saturday, they would bless the water, holy water. And the priest, you'd bring the water in little mason jars, and they'd, and they'd bring it to the priest, you'd, you'd bring it to them, and they'd bless the water, and you can use that water to bless people, bless your house. Well, I had a little business going when they did this on this Saturday where they did it. I had, a, I had a little shopping cart, and I would collect all these bottles, and I would go, and I would go around the corner to my friend's house. I'd fill all the bottles up with water, and I'd bring them back, and of course, these ladies are giving $2 for each bottle. So I give them their holy water. There's people bless their houses with just regular tap water. So when Cheryl told me about tithing, I said, God's getting back at me. I said, are you crazy? You, take, you don't earn that much money and you give 10% to the church? I said, are you nuts? Are you crazy? They don't need your money. I said, the church should be giving you money. She said, let me show you in scripture. Listen, I didn't know a word of scripture when I got saved. When Cheryl led me to the Lord, she led me to the Lord, I had no knowledge of Scripture. Not one single verse. And so uh, she would show me the Scripture, and I'd say to her something down the line when I started to try to get an excuse and say, well, that's the Old Testament. She said, yeah, you get off easy. Jesus said to give everything you have. <laughs> Sell all. So tithing is a great principle. I never talk about money. I'll say this one last thing. I preached one message about money in my entire ministry career, which spans... A lot of decades. And I, I only preached it because I love the message title I came up with. Cirrhosis of the Giver. <laughs> I love that message title. But we don't do it because we're we don't do it because we're following the Mosaic law. We do it because of obedience and God blessing us. Come on, somebody say amen. So uh, and by the way, there's other things we do that's Old Testament that we do because of obedience, not because we have to be accepted by doing that. All of that was and is required after conversion was an appropriate conduct. That's all they said. You get saved. So what do we, what do we learn from this council? Well, we learn a couple things. We, we learn this, first of all, and I'm going to start weaving scripture together for you in a moment. Some individuals that question Christian freedom from the law. Paul, Barnabas, and others uh, go to Jerusalem from Antioch. Paul, Barnabas, Peter, and James were principals in the meeting. The issue discussion was the question of the Gentile circumcision. The Jerusalem apostles agreed not to demand it and not to demand anything else. So just listen as I bring you to the next step. The Gentile converts should abstain from foods previously sacrificed to idols, from strangled animals which still contain blood, from fornication. We can imagine from our experience in group dec decisions, they probably started up with a whole list of hundreds of Levitical regulations and ended up with just what they felt was absolutely required for a purity of life. They went down, no, we don't, we don't tell them to do that. No, we don't tell them to do that. They also were concerned about unnecessarily offending Jews scattered in the Gentile world by a flagrant disregard for those rules which were so sacred to them. This is an excellent display of the Holy Spirit's gift of wisdom through human channels. A letter was drafted explaining the action and a group including Paul and Barnabas was elected to distribute it to the church. The Holy Spirit had won the struggle for faith as the only basis of salvation. Only faith. That's all you need. Paul could hardly wait to get back to the churches in Galatia to tell the Gentiles of the victory that had been won in Jerusalem. Later, when he learned that the Judaizers 
were still hassling his beloved friends, he wrote the epistle to the Galatians. I told you, he wrote the epistle to the Galatians from Antioch. The reason he did is because Judaizers were still in the church even after the letter and they weren't getting it. They were still confusing people. The whole epistle should be read as a part of our understanding of the momentous decision that had been made in Jerusalem. If you could take a string and tie it through your Bible from Acts chapter 15 to Galatians, they relate to each other. The whole Galatian epistle is to talk again Against Judaizers to tell the Galatian believers, what are you doing? Why are you listening to these Judaizers? How does he start it out? He says, you foolish Galatians. What are you doing? Why are you going back on what we've told you? Who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? Who's been messing with your head telling you that you've got to get circumcised again? Because you have people in the church, in these churches of Galatians, preaching something different. Look what Paul writes to the Galatian believers just, the, just in chapter 3 alone. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? How did you receive the Holy Spirit? He tells the Galatians. Did you do something to get the Holy Spirit? Was there some law you did or was it just because you heard about it? Uh, signs and wonders have been done before the Galatians during the first preaching of the gospel. You and I went over it. The signs demonstrate that the message advanced by Paul was endorsed by the powers of heaven. Another possibility is that they had received the Spirit when God sent forth the Spirit into their hearts. He continues to talk them at 7 and 8, verse chapter 3. Apparently the Judaizers had made much of their supposed connection to Abraham as they sought to subvert the minds of the Galatians. They were teaching these are Christians who are Judaizers. They were trying to get them back to the old law. They're teaching that they had a connection with Abraham and these Gentiles had to have a connection. It's going to make a whole lot of sense to you in a moment. The Jews gloried in their physical descent from the patriarch. We are, we are born, of, Mo, we are born of, the, of Abraham. They supposed that God's blessing to Abraham had all descended to them in a way that could never be altered. Why do you think Paul will later write that there's neither Jew nor Greek? Why would he write that, there's the, that Jesus has broken down the wall of separation? Because people thought that they were better because they they had, they were, they were Jewish Christians instead of just regular Christians. Just like some people think that because they speak in tongues, they're better than someone else. And Paul says, I speak in tongues more than y'all. Stop fighting about it. It doesn't make you better. It's just another work of God. Come on, somebody say amen. In fact, the relationship to Jehovah was defined by their connection that they enjoyed with the greatest man in their national history. We have more of a, a say with God because we have been born underneath Abraham. Why do you think Paul said that we are adopted in? Come on, somebody say amen. So it all makes sense. He goes on and he tells them this in chapter 3 verse 8 he says the same gospel good news that had been preached to the Galatians had first been preached to Abraham it's most significant message in all in you all nations shall be blessed that's what he said to, to Abraham all nations shall be blessed not just the Jewish nation this blessing would be spiritual not physical it would bless all nations through faith not through law the promise was made years before Christ it would justify the nations the promise of justification by faith was made many years before the law of Moses he says they have nothing to stand on. These Judaizers are trying to get you to take a couple steps backward when you are free. He who the Son sets free is free. That's what he said. And that's what we have to know. The impact of this for our lives is undeniable. Our righteousness with God is through faith and not through compulsive fulfillment of our own ideas of what God requires for us. You know, you can't say, well, I'm bad. God, I'm too bad. God doesn't love me. You can't be too bad for God not to love you. It's impossible. You can't say, well, I'm good because I've done everything. God loves me more. You can't be too good for God to love you more than me. Trust me, He doesn't love you more than me. And He doesn't love you less than me. We are all loved with the same universal love from God. Come on, somebody say amen. It doesn't mean that there are no dis disciplines for our living of faith. It doesn't mean that you say, oh, well, grace is it. and We'll go on here. And I can do anything I want. What it does mean is that faith brings us to the fellowship with God who through His indwelling Spirit then gives us the power to do what He has lovingly provided for us in the Ten Commandments and in Christ's message as a chart for living. This debate about, how law, about law and grace, believe it or not, will continue to plague Paul as he tried to teach believers. It's rising again in Christianity today. There's a grace movement going on today that wants you to exclude everything else. This is not a problem that has gone away. It continues to go, to go there, especially in our accepted society where all they want you to know about is the love and the grace of God. Grace is definitely there, but we've got to be very careful that we don't go on one side or the other. Come on, somebody say amen. It's rising again. It's called the grace gospel. Why do we need a grace gospel? Grace is included in the gospel. Why do you need a separate teaching on grace gospel? Why do we have churches that are grace churches? That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I'm going to say it again. It's ridiculous. Grace has always been there. It's not like, oh, we finally found grace. It's always been there. So, and although it's true, 
It's taking the same nasty turn it took in Paul's day. Because in short, nothing is required of me for salvation. That's grace. I can act any way I want. I can be anything I want to be because grace will be extended to everyone. And they take it to the other extreme. I'm a, I'm a Christian homosexual. Listen, I'd love to tell you that homosexuality is okay. I can't because the Bible says it's not okay. And so I can't tell you that. I would, but to tell you that God's grace covers it and don't worry about it, your lifestyle is okay. It's like me telling you if you're an adulterer, don't worry about it. Grace covers it. You don't have to ask forgiveness. Don't even work on it. Or you're, 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 a, you're a murderer. Well, don't worry about it. God has grace. Of course he'll forgive you, but not so you continue to go on doing the same sins. How come people don't get this? Listen, we don't need to err on the side of the law and legalisms, but we dare not err on the side of grace either. Let me just show you what, what Scripture says. In Romans 6.12. This is not popular opinion. I am so sick of people's opinions. I'm going to tell you that in a moment. I'm going to get on that bandwagon in a moment. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer in it? Paul's giving you the balance. Just because grace is there doesn't mean you continue to sin because grace is there. It's ridiculous. Uh, just, because, just because there's a law doesn't mean you have to apply the law so somebody can be accepted by God. How many are getting this? How many are getting it? Raise your hand. Watch. So watch. Now we live the commandments. Listen, the results of this Jerusalem council is a checklist for us when we think people should measure up to our own standards in order to be a Christian. Now we live in the commandments. The great commandment to love God, ourselves, and others. And the Sermon on the Mount. Not to be approved, but because we already are approved. On the basis of that approval, we can be, you know, evaluate what behavior is best for the Lord's glory and for our growth. Your good behavior is for you. Listen. And we, do, uh, and we do it all in the amazed awareness that He loves us right now as much as He will ever love you. God loves you right now as much as He will ever love you. He will never love you more than He loves you right now. It's hard for people to understand. It's hard for us to wrap our heads around. He loves you. He loved you when you were a sinner. He loved you while you were yet a sinner. That's unimaginable for me. I can't even fathom that. It'll take a whole lifetime and all of eternity for us to understand that. So armed as, with that, we can confront the Judaizing tendencies and our attitude to other people. You should never judge someone who's a homosexual. Ever. You should never tell them they're going to hell. If you've ever walked in a line that had a sign saying all homosexuals are going to hell, turn it around and look at it yourself because we're all sinners. This is not an us and them. You know, and everybody wants to make it that way in America today. Everybody wants to make it us and them. It's not us and them. We're their answer. We're not, we're not their protagonists. Come on. So listen to me, all right? I know you are. So who do we, do we hold off from Christ or from fellowship with us because they don't measure up to what our standards are? What culture or religious custom have we added to the gospel as requirements before we give people our approval of them? What non-biblical standard of conduct have we blended with our own authority and used to determine whether a person is or is not an acceptable Christian. And what principle of theology or aspect of our own experience have we used to judge others? These questions help me. They really help me. And hopefully they'll help you to admit that the struggle that we all go through, all of us, in order to live by faith alone as our justification, justification with God and our evaluation of the spirituality of others. We are not to evaluate the spirituality of others. If you ever say about someone in the pulpit, oh, they, they're so holy. We're all holy. Holy means you're separated. Hagios. You're separated to God. You are all holy. We're all holy, separated to God. Don't ever think that someone's spirituality is better than your spirituality. If it is, don't mention it. If you think it is, then don't mention it. Because it's a slap in the face to God. Because he makes us all acceptable to him. He loves us all equal. How many are with me tonight? Yeah. It's revolutionary. Our hope is that the Lord's Unmerited grace will make us resign from being Judaizers and jo join Paul in reaching others with the unqualified, non-judgmental love of the gospel. Listen, grace is when you get the good things you don't deserve. Mercy is when you're spared from the bad things you do deserve. And God is generous with both of them. This is his unmitigated love, his unadulterated love. It goes out no matter what we do. It's grace. That doesn't mean you can do anything you want. Come on. How many are with me tonight? I can't believe it's still around the church and it's still, still something people debate. While we ourselves personally don't take his grace for granted, obviously we don't, but live lives reaching for the purity Jesus molded and modeled for us. Wow, what a mouthful. 
So let me leave you with a barrage of thoughts tonight to help us through difficulties in dealing with others as Christians. And before I do it, let me tell you this. I am sick and tired of politics. I have had it up to here hearing about politics. I'm sick and tired of President Trump's tweets. Up to here. I'm sick and tired of the wranglings that go on in Washington. Up to here I've had it. I'm sick and tired of our, of our news. Our news is disgusting. I'm sick and tired. I am sick and tired of opinions. I'm sick and tired of social media and everybody saying their opinion. No one cares about your opinion. All they care about is being heard. How many are with me? I'm tired of it. You know why? Because that's not what we're called to do. I have an opinion. I share some opinions with you. Some people go against me when I share opinions. That's wonderful. That's fun. I'm, most of all, I'm sick and tired of other, opinions, other people's opinions. That I, that's all I hear it anymore is opinions. I, you can't even turn on a newscast without hearing an anchor's opinion. Now, I'm not saying I'm against Trump. I'm not saying I'm for Trump. What? I'm giving you a different tack. We think a president's going to answer our needs. He's not going to answer our needs. We think that he's going to do everything right. We try to make every president that has the same kind of needs a little bit that we have, we try to make them Christians. What's with us? What are we doing? You don't need to stack the deck in your favor. You don't need to have an opinion. Your opinion is divining. It's divisive. When we give opinions to people who don't agree with us, you divide them. You push them away. Come on, how many are with me? Listen. You don't, listen, I think, I think, I just want to, I just want to lead a life that adds to people's lives. I want to give them something they don't have. I mean, that's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't tell the Samaritan woman that she was an adulteress. Five times over, she's looking for a man. That's why she was there. He didn't tell her that. He wasn't judging her. That doesn't mean he didn't have something for her. He said to her, drink of this water and you'll never thirst again. I want people to look at me not because I have a different opinion than them, but because they can drink of the same water I'm drinking of and they won't have to thirst anymore. We're the answer for the world. They don't want your opinion. They already know it. They don't want it. They want to see love and they want to see you reach out. Now, if somebody says to me, Pastor Mark, what do you think about this? Then I'm going to have to tell them this is what I think, but that's not, that doesn't mean that I am judging you. Come on. How many understand? Listen, social media has fueled it. Their opinions are like cell phones, I think. Everybody has one. And they don't know how, to, how or when to turn them off. That's exactly what it is. So here's my barrage of thoughts tonight, what I want to leave you with. People were created to be loved. Things were created to be used. The reason why the world is in chaos is because things are being loved and people are being used. Jesus didn't say, follow Christians. He said, follow me. I never want to be the kind of Christian who portrays themselves as perfect. I have flaws, and if you don't believe it, ask Cheryl. And I have struggles, and that's why I need Jesus. Listen, I'm talking about me. I need Jesus. Not they need Jesus. I need Jesus. You still with me tonight? I'm a Christian. I'm not perfect. I make mistakes. I mess up. But God's grace is bigger than my sins. That's not grace because I sin. It's grace in spite of my sins. Look, Scripture. For by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest any one of us can boast. It's powerful stuff. Listen. The only works of righteousness that will ever justify me are the works of Christ. Nothing you can do will make you perfect and innocent in God's eyes. Nothing you can do. It's only what Jesus did for us. Somebody say amen. A lady came up to me last week. Actually, she gave her heart to the Lord. Another lady came up with her. And one lady said to me, two people said it at different times. They said, I couldn't believe the illustration you gave of the styrofoam ball. It makes so much sense to me that we're, we're all, we're all uh, bent in iniquity and, and we're black and God can't look on sin. And so with that black styrofoam and God's pure white can't look on sin, Hosea tells us. But Jesus takes our sin on him, but he's all the righteousness of God. So God looks at me. She finally got it. It was like a switch turned on. She said, God really looks at me through Jesus. He doesn't look straight at me and everything I do right or wrong. I said, you want to teach next week? <laughs> That's it. Now watch as we continue tonight. You still with me tonight? Yeah. All right. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Somebody say amen. amen. And brought us into the kingdom of of the son he loves. He did not bring you into the American system. He didn't bring you into the world kingdom. 
He brought you into a different kingdom. You are not the same as the world. Sure, you can listen to the news. Sure, you can listen to all the ramblings. But let me tell you something. You are never going to get any solace or peace by listening to all the problems that are going on in America, ever. There is a kingdom that gives you peace in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins, Colossians tells us. And this one is good. I like this one. If you think you've blown God's plan for your life, rest in this. You, my beautiful friend, are not that powerful. You can't blow it. God loves you. He has ordained for you to be part of the kingdom. He has called you. He has first called you. You haven't called him. He chose you. He knows the plans and purposes he has for you. You cannot blow his plan for your life. Oh, you can mess it up and delay it, like Abraham did, but you cannot blow it. All you need to do is trust God. I was telling somebody the other day they had questions. People have lots of questions. A long time ago, you don't have to be like me, a long time ago I resolved myself never to question God, ever. Because, you know why? It's like an ant looking at me and saying, why did you build that house? He have no concept. The ways of God are way beyond our ways. You can question God all day long, it's like running after your tail. Just find a dog that's running after his tail, that's what happens when you question God. There are questions that God, there are answers that I, have, I don't have. I stood in the room when they, when they took the plug off of a woman a couple days ago with her family, and I had to talk to her entire family. I told them this, I don't have words to comfort you. If you're looking for me to, get, to give answers, I don't have answers. All I have for you is hope. Hope. But I'm here to give you hope. Jesus said, this is not our last state. Jesus said he's going to be with us in heaven. And all I have is hope. And that's all I need is hope. I don't need anything else than hope. I don't need answers to all the questions. You know, there's times my kids used to come to me when they were young and say, Dad, why did you do this? Say, well, you're too young. You don't understand. If I explain it to you, you still wouldn't get it. Listen, if God explained everything he did, he's doing, you still wouldn't get it. Neither would, neither would I. Come on, how many are with me tonight? Yeah. So blind trust and hope. That's the, whole, that's the whole definition of faith. Faith is stepping off of a mountain without knowing where you're going. That's trust. Life is a life of faith. So tonight I'm going to ask us to bow our heads just for a moment. Man, I love preaching the truth. You know that? Because the truth is what sets you free. I'm not interested in religion. I'm not interested in denominations. I'm interested in the relationship with Christ. You want answers? Trust me. God has them all. If he hasn't revealed some of them to you, there's a reason. I believe that God has my best in mind. I believe I can't mess up what he's given me. I believe I can mess up the plans and the details of it, but I can't mess up salvation. There's no way. This last one with your heads about I'm going to read to you. It says this, I love you. You're mine. Your name is written upon my heart. Your prayers are precious to me. Your life is in my hands. I am always with you. I am nearer to you than your own heart. I gave my life so that you might live forever with me so I can ask you to be mine. If Jesus were to write us a letter, that's what it would be. If Jesus had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. Let me tell you something. He loves you with a love that you can't understand. So stop beating yourself up. When you fail and you fall, get back up. Ask for his forgiveness. Say, God, help me tomorrow. Stop beating yourself up. That's grace. And those of you that think you can do anything, whether you're listening to me at home or across the nations, you think you can do anything and God's going to love you, wake up. Wake up. You're only hurting yourself and you're jeopardizing your salvation. So today, grace is there. There's enough law there for us to follow that because of our obedience that God will bless us. So tonight with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I'm going to ask one question. How many of you have ever been in conflict with yourself over these issues? We're talking about resolving conflicts. I just spoke to you calmly. Resolve it in your mind. How many of you realize what I'm saying this week? How many of you realize what I'm saying tonight? Raise your hand. How many of you get it tonight? How many are ready to accept the grace of God? Would you stand up with me? Let's pray. Man, don't you love Bible study? Don't you love getting into the Word? This is, I love doing this. I just love it. I really do. Father, we just thank you tonight. Thank you for your Word. Lord, I feel like we were at the Jerusalem Council tonight. I feel like we, you transported us back in time. We, we saw something resolved by your Holy Spirit. And we came to a knowledge of knowing what grace and the law meant, means. And I'm so thankful for your grace, Lord God. I'm so thankful for your love. Lord, while you were dying on the cross, you loved me just like you love me now. And I thank you tonight, Lord God, for loving us all the same. Bless us tonight, Lord. Heaven must be amazing 
as that love is shared universally all over. I thank you tonight for those who have come. Lord God, bless them. Lord, let them realize, Lord God, that they are, they are ultimate in, the ultimate purpose for them is in your hands and that you would have it that none of us should be kept from that. Bless us tonight, Lord God. Give us our destinies. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen.